from me. So take my heart and mold it. Take my Take my mind. If you believe it, lift your hands and say, Transform. Change my thinking, Lord. And take my will. And conform to yours. To yours. Oh, Just reach up your hand and say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on all over this sanctuary, just raise your hands and say hallelujah. This is the classroom. This is the sanctuary. We are being exposed to the characteristics needed for preaching, for transformation. When we leave these hallowed grounds, return to our cities, our neighborhoods, our communities, we should be ready to preach for transformation. Can you just lift your hand and say, I'm ready? Come on, say it like you mean it. I'm ready. I'm ready. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. We praise God for his presence in the preach word. 
this anointing and scan this massive congregation. I can see the tears of both men and women as we responded to the power of his presence. The president has, uh, Dr. Dwight Riddit, has written a book entitled, Does Preaching Yet Have a Future? And I would encourage you to stop by the table and pick up this book and take it home with you. And I think we can all affirm Preaching does have a future if our communities are going to be saved. Amen. Amen. We prepare now to enter the classroom of the Spirit. And our first presenter today is the one and only Dr. Carolyn Knight. And I ask that you would just receive her with God. Bless you, applause, Dr. Carolyn. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for who you are and for what you've already done. God, we feel your presence in this place. We thank you right now for all that we've already heard, all that we already felt, all that we've already experienced in this place. God, we thank you for every man, woman, boy, and girl assembled here today. We thank you, oh God, for the call upon our lives in such a time as this. God, we thank you because there is a world beyond these walls that stands in need of what we already have, what we've already felt, what we've already experienced. We thank you right now, oh God, because there are men and women, boys and girls, situations, issues, and circumstances beyond the these walls that stand in need of the power that we already have. Thank you for calling us to be preachers of the gospel in such a time as this. Now, God, show yourself strong in us and in this world. Do what you do best. Work in situations and work things out while we're trying to figure them out. God, we thank you for this conference. We thank you that we are being transformed in this place. Now use us, God, for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We thank God for God's presence in this place for what we've already heard and experienced. God is a wonder and I feel God's presence in this place. We thank God again for Dr. Riddick and Reverend Hagen and for the generous opportunity to stand before you uh, in this 102nd Hampton Ministers Conference. I thank God that um, I was sharing with some preachers at lunch um, that I first came here in 1981 with Dr. Wyatt T. Walker. And uh, when I first came here, women were not even reading scripture or praying. And now look what God has done. Look how God has moved. We've had our first uh, female president. Amen. We've had women as conference preachers and morning preachers and lecturing. And I thank God that I'm still alive to see it all. Amen. Amen. If the Lord sees fit on August 7th, I will say goodbye to one decade and enter into another and 
you can figure it out, whichever one you think it is. <laughs> you think I'm going from my 30s to 40s, that's all right with me. <laughs> but whichever decade you think I'm about to go into, that's fine with me. But I thank God that I am still alive and that God still allows me to be a part in some small measure of this, um, uh, this great conference. And I'm very thankful to be a preacher in such a time as this. I thank God that God uses all of us uh, in times like these. You know, God is at God's best when the world is at its worst. So this is not a time for the church to be nervous or shaken or rattled or frazzled because God is at God's best when we find ourselves in situations such as we are now. Now, I got a, a lot of questions yesterday as I moved around the campus, and one uh, particularly that I feel the need to uh, at least clarify in some small measure. Um, Yesterday I made, and I make it again without hesitation or reservation or apology, that uh, if people are not getting the point that you are making in the sermon, it is not the fault of the listener. There is some unclarity in the sermon that is not resonating or connecting with the listener. Now, let me, let me give you an illustration to say why I say that, and to hopefully uh, it'll clear, clarify those who ask me the question. You go to a restaurant and order a meal and when the meal is served and it is not to your liking, you don't blame yourself. I'll wait till you all catch up with that. You don't blame yourself. You say I should have ordered, you may say I should have ordered something different or I shouldn't have come to this restaurant. But you don't blame yourself for the meal being bad. Who do you blame? You blame the chef. Because it is your expectation that the chef knows what he is doing, he or she is doing, has adequately prepared has mixed the right ingredients, set the oven to the right temperature in order that the meal might be presented to you as it is intended. Amen? The people who come to hear us preach on Sunday morning come with the same expectations that you have properly prepared added the right ingredients, mixed them together, exegesis, hermeneutics, apologetics, and mixed them together so that when you stand to preach, the meal is properly prepared. And so that's why I say that if people don't get the point that you are making in the sermon, it's not the fault of the people. All right. Today, as we move forward in our understanding of preaching for transformation, I want to um, continue to argue that transformation is or ought to be moving us forward into a radical newness, into a relationship with God that we've never experienced before as individuals, churches, or institutions. Transformation gives us the opportunity for a new relationship with God and the world that we have never experienced before. 
Several months ago now, while listening to Dr. Marcus D. Cosby preach from Romans, the 12th chapter, he helped me to understand uh, what transformation looks like. Dr. Cosby says that transformation, becoming radically new in Christ and in the world, is not a matter of rearranging the furniture in the house. It is not a matter of redecorating or remodeling or renovating or even rehabilitating. It is a matter of doing away with that which is old and becoming completely new. That is what transformation, preaching for transformation, uh, seeks to accomplish. So today I want us to further understand why every sermon must be developed, designed, and delivered to bring about transformation. Now let me add this codicil also that I should have uh, been a part of my presentation on yesterday. I did uh, mention that all preaching begins with God. God is the first preacher. God spoke and the world came into existence. God spoke and all things were created. We speak because God has already spoken. We speak because God has given us something to say. God is the original preacher. Our preaching does not cause God to show up. We preach because God is already present, informing, influencing, inspiring, and impacting all of our preaching. The presence of God is the reason we preach and the reason that we have something to say. This understanding is necessary if preaching is to be transformative. Now, next preaching is a written oral event. It takes place in the set, setting of a worshiping congregation. As such, it is the speaking of a certain language for a certain purpose. Jesus spoke with specificity. It was his nature to be specific. So it is in our preaching for transformation that we must learn the lesson of specificity. Preaching does not occur in a vacuum. There are persons who sit in our pews Sunday after Sunday who are the recipients of that which is preached. It is the speaking of a certain language for a certain purpose. If we understand the sermon as that which the preacher has not, not as that which the preacher has written down, but that which the preacher says, we further must understand that the sermon is not a sermon until it is preached until it has a live encounter with the recipients of the sermon. To understand this for transformation suggests that the preacher must be concerned about the use of sacred language. In the world, it is through discourse, human discourse, language, that we affirm or disavow persons, institutions, ideologies, different faiths and cultures. In language, we marginalize, disenfranchise, uh, devaluate and alienate persons or groups uh, that function outside of our particular worldview. It is through language uh, that we lie, deceive ourselves, insult one another, and reduce the mystery and wonder of the world and nature to that which is meaningless. So, 
the language of militarism, mili military, uh, materialism, sexism, racism, mass incarceration, and poverty exist in societies and in individuals like a constant metaphor. It is through language that we alienate, negate, and denigrate persons from other races, genders, and sexes. It is through language that men objectify women and women disrespect women. Language guides our agendas and our motives. Let me press that further. For the last 13 months or so, one man has be, who has not been elected to, to be so much as dog catcher without any political experience, without any organization to speak of, has positioned himself to within a 50-50 chance of being the next leader of the United States of America. How has he done it? By the use of disruptive and distracting language that has caused his followers, those who believe in his message, to behave in such a way to alter, to transform the landscape of this nation. When facing 16 opponents, he simply labeled them, branded them, and in the eyes of his followers, they became whatever he called them. Whatever language he used, in the eyes of his followers, that is what they became. Language is powerful. So if he said low energy, that's what they became. If he said little, that's what they became. If he called them liars, that's what they became. If they became a so-so doctor, that's what they became. He kept using that language and employing that disruptive and distractive language till he eliminated the lower tier and the upper tier, and he became the last man standing. He did that without use of a military. He didn't use any weapons. He didn't have any physical fights that we know of. It was the use of language that he eliminated every opponent that he faced. Language is powerful. So then the only way to modify or eradicate uh, or eliminate uh, disruptive, corruptive, and corruptive discourse is to counter it with a more powerful and more modifying narrative. Transformative preaching must make use of a new master narrative, different ways of speaking, and different ways of listening. That is, persons in the pew have their ways of listening and interpreting sacred language. If preaching is to be truly transformative, the language employed in our sermons must reach their interpretive life. The people who listen to us preach negotiate the world by flow, by way of interpretation. Preaching that is transformative must model modifying language that counters disruptive and alienating discourse. The language that is employed in our preaching must be viewed as sacred language, sacred rhetoric, if you will. We must never forget that Christian preaching originated in a historical period when the love of rhetoric and the love for rhetoric was the order of the day. 
Cicero and Aristotle were around during the time of Jesus. Socrates was around. More importantly, Christian preaching and its language countered the disruptive discourse of the Greek and Hellenistic period. Further, the early church grew on the strength of its preaching. The president said on Monday night that Jonah, without all of the accruements that we have today, was able to transform an entire city. So such was the case uh, with the early church. It grew on the strength of its preaching. The early church went from 120 to 3,000 to 8,000 persons uh, on the strength of preaching and prayer alone. What Peter preached on the day of Pentecost was a modifying discourse, a modifying language uh, that was interpreted by those who heard it uh, in such a way that it altered their worldview. Initially, it was thought that those who were moved by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost uh, uh, were intoxicated, that they were drunk. Uh, that is what the scriptures tell us. Uh, that was distracting, uh, disruptive discourse uh, intended to modify and alienate uh, certain ethnic groups uh, and cultures. Uh, but Peter stood up and intervened uh, with a modifying language uh, which altered the thinking of those uh, who heard him speak. Uh, brothers and sisters, these are not drunk as you suppose. And then he continued to preach in such a way uh, that at the end of the message, uh, the persons who heard him uh, made the appropriate response uh, to the message. Uh, what shall we do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and you shall uh, be saved. Uh, so Peter was able to interrupt the, the disruptive, distracting language uh, with modifying discourse uh, that altered the world view of those who heard him preach. Uh, and they made the appropriate response to the message uh, that was preached. Uh, preaching that is transformative allows people who hear it uh, to make an appropriate response uh, to the message. Uh, persons who are transformed by our preaching uh, are transformed by the interpretation uh, of our preaching. Uh, not so much by what is written down, uh, but by what is spoken. In our time, we are given a boost by the late, uh, preaching is given a boost by late uh, 20th century homiletic theory. How is it that preaching and rhetoric come together to modify and counter and eradicate disruptive discourse? It is through the use of sacred rhetoric that we accomplish the bridge between the biblical passage and the situation of the congregation. Preaching that is transformative must so restate the message of the biblical text or text that it communicates or applies to the situation. Bringing new interpretation that changes how the listener sees and understands the world. Until the listener of the sermon has the world of the gospel opened up to them in a new way that counters and alters their present uh, reality or situation, uh, there is no hope for transformation. When people gather for worship Sunday or on other occasions, uh, they do not believe, leave behind uh, all of the stuff uh, that they encounter uh, 
during the world. Uh, they bring it into worship with them. Uh, they sit in worship with it. Uh, they sit in church with all of their problems uh, and all of their situations. Uh, the expectation of the listener then uh, is that the preacher will connect their hopes uh, for transformation uh, and new possibilities uh, to the God of the gospel. The preacher places before God uh, the specific situations uh, of tragedy, suffering, and pain uh, in this life. Uh, the God of our praise and our worship is known in the first place uh, primarily in connection to human events. Uh, the preacher has the responsibility or the task then to create a language uh, that, um, hold on, phone going off. The preacher has a responsibility then uh, to connect the gospel uh, to the world in which the listener lives. Uh, the preacher has the determination uh, by the mix of the biblical passage uh, and situation uh, to connect the language. And the language must emerge uh, from a radically different understanding of the gospel and divine mystery. That is what makes it uh, sacred language. Gospel is always and without exception the subject of our preaching. It is the what of our preaching. That means that what the preacher preaches is never simply a matter of a particular text. It is never simply a matter of a passage from the Hebrew Bible or a Pauline letter or an ancient creed confessed, uh, or some specific behavior urged or forbidden. The gospel or the good news, uh, the charisma of the coming of the kingdom of God uh, is what Jesus Christ preached. And when Paul announces uh, that what he preaches is the crucified Christ, uh, he means that the content of his preaching uh, is the good news that salvation uh, is now available uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, this is preaching's only subject. Uh, the good news set forth in the face of the tragic, distortive, oppressing human events that we face, uh, that the human heart, uh, human relations, uh, and even human institutions uh, can be radically and redemptively transformed. The subject of our preaching, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, takes on flesh takes on detail and possibility when it is specific and directed to our tragic and oppressive situations, when it appropriates the narratives, persons, and events of Scripture that attest to the radical and redemptive uh, transformation that is possible. Uh, because the gospel is good news uh, about human and historical transformation, uh, it can never be reduced uh, to a single motif, a uh, theme, uh, or idea. What happens then when something other than the gospel is what the preacher preaches. The result is that the gospel and the world of the gospel moves into the background and replaces the situation of the day. It replaces the situation of the day or the value system, the piety, the doctrinal convictions, and becomes the moral stances of the preacher. 
When the situation becomes what the preacher preaches, preaching turns into a rehearsal of various cultural, psychological, and political problems. Such a discourse may be certain wisdom, but its genre is closer to a lecture than to preaching. The late Samuel D. Witt Proctor said, preaching is not taking refuge uh, in the empty moralisms, uh, admonishing listeners and congregation uh, to get out there and do better and to do good uh, and to just try to have more faith. Uh, neither is preaching becoming prophets of gloom and doom, uh, describing in vivid detail what is wrong with individuals and institutions, uh, this nation and in the world, uh, and then leaving congregations and listeners wallowing in their guilt or despair. It is not ending the sermons with vague and generalized uh, assurances that nevertheless uh, the listeners have been saved and have new meaning given to their lives uh, and the rest they will understand better by and by. Preaching that is transformative uh, or that seeks to transform uh, acknowledges the limits uh, of pie-in-the-sky theology uh, without rejecting its strengths. Uh, but more importantly, it means having a grounded theology uh, that is able to answer, answer the tough questions uh, in light of what God has done uh, and what God has promised uh, through the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, preaching for transformation uh, is also a theological activity. Preaching that has as its end uh, transformation uh, involves the preacher in serious theological reflection. The preacher cannot preach without a firm understanding uh, of what God has done in the past, uh, is doing in the present, uh, and will do in the future. To preach sermons that transform, uh, the preacher must be thoroughly convinced uh, that God is actively involved in the affairs of humankind uh, and is concerned about a harmonious solution uh, or resolution to these needs and these concerns. Uh, in this regard, uh, the preacher is taking a risk to be sure. Preaching involves a risk. Preaching is risky business, but it is not the credibility or the integrity of the preacher that is at stake. It is God's. It is God who seeks to transform. It is God who desires reconciliation. Now, it is God who desires right relationships. Uh, it is God who started this entire process. Uh, therefore, it is God's message. Uh, it is God's actions. Uh, it is God who has spoken into existence uh, the possibility of transformation uh, of individuals becoming new creatures in Jesus Christ. Uh, it is God who has spoken into existence uh, the possibility of a better world and a better future. It is God who is moving us towards a future hope uh, and new possibilities uh, where we will learn war no more and the lion and the lamb will commune together and people will no longer be afraid. Uh, this is what God has declared to us uh, that is possible in and through uh, the gospel. Uh, in uh, therefore, transformative preaching ought to move us uh, to this already but not yet reality. Since it is God who has begun the process, uh, it is God's word and God's credibility uh, that is on the line. Now, it is God's name who is on the line. Now, it is God's credibility that is at stake. Uh, but it is through the preacher 
that the integrity and the credibility of God are manifested. When the preacher has re resolved his or her own theology in the light of the reality as they have experienced, the message of God has wider acceptance and believability. The preacher as theologian must have worked through their own understanding uh, of God and how God uh, acts in the world. Uh, the gospel, they must understand uh, how the gospel is lived out uh, in everyday circumstances. Uh, theology is how we reflect on and think about uh, what we believe. Uh, therefore, theology must show up in our preaching. Theology clarifies, makes clear, highlights, illuminates, uh, makes uh, articulate uh, that which we preach. Uh, theology's role in our preaching uh, is to articulate and feel the social particularity, institutionality, and world construction uh, of the faith uh, that we hold. Uh, every preacher must remember that we once sat where the listener now sits. Integrity in our preaching is a prerequisite to preaching for transformation. We can, cannot possibly expect transformation in the pew or the seat unless there has been transformation in the pulpit. Preachers who have been transformed or, or who are being transformed uh, transformation is a process, are best equipped and prepared to lead in transformation and to preach transformation. The transformation of the preacher ought to be a model of transformation for the congregation. The words of Agar A. Guest were true then and they are true now. I'd rather see a sermon than to hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. So in the preparation of preaching, in the preparing the sermon, the preacher is challenged to remember the sermon that challenged them, that convinced them, that convicted them, to be radically transformed. Further in the preparation of the sermon, the preacher must ask themselves, and this is what I want to give a homework assignment for tonight. Tonight, when you go back to your hotel room or wherever, I want you to ask yourself and be prepared to reflect on them tomorrow. I want you to ask yourself question number one. Would the sermon that I am preparing to preach on Sunday morning transform me? With this sermon that I am preparing to preach, change me. Question number two, and really not a question, I want you to think about tonight in your hotel room and be prepared to reflect on it tomorrow. What type of sermon moved you when you got out of your seat, walked down the aisle, gave the preacher your hand, and God your heart? 
What was it about that sermon that moved you on that day when you joined the church? Think about that. Then the third question that I want you to think about and to be prepared to answer, and this is preaching for transformation. I want you to ask yourself, Carolyn, would the preaching that I do now move me if I were in the pew. I want you to go back to when you weren't a member of the church, when you weren't in Christ, and imagine yourself in the pew and in the pulpit and ask yourself, would the preaching that I do save me? Now, and the third question, or the fourth question, and I'm through, uh, I want you to be able to think about Depending on how you answer that question, I want you to be able to think about on tomorrow, what are you prepared to do? So you've got at least three questions. Is the sermon that I'm preparing to preach on Sunday, with that sermon transform me? Would it save me? What kind of preaching moved you when you first joined the church? When you first gave the preacher your hand and God your heart? Third, is the preaching that I'm doing now, would it save me? Would it transform me? Would it make me join the church? However I respond to that question, what are you prepared to do? We'll go further tomorrow. God bless.